So we've, uh, we've put up a picture of two of our colleagues uh, not present in the room today, uh, one being Jasper Ledekerk, our head of litigation, and one of our former managing partner. I don't know why they're in the picture, <laughs> but let's click them away and, uh, and make a start. Get started, indeed. Um, yeah, that's <clears> what we're <throat> going to do. So here we have the, the outline. We'll be starting with an introduction and background, starting uh, with an introduction of ourselves. Then we'll um, note the concept of front loading of thinking, which we think is pretty important in respect of the topic at hand. Topic being, how do you get from a current litigation or for, from a context in which you have provided from litigation into arbitration, if you really think that's a good plan? We'll try to help you today with figuring out in what sort of circumstances that might be a good idea um, and which sort of considerations you'll be encountering. Um, and also in particular, what sort of arena you will be stepping into, i.e. If you actually move to arbitration, what do you get? So that's the third item from litigation to arbitration, the opportunities. We'll be uh, focusing on three particular topics on which we have also uh, done some thinking uh, before in terms of publications and research, both academically, Bas and myself, not so academically as a practitioner. Uh, under the fourth item, uh, we'll be looking at, uh, let's say, particularities, technicalities, things that, that will, will be uh, sort of life when you actually take the decision to move from litigation or arbitration or when someone confronts you with that option, wouldn't it be a good idea to move our litigation to an arbitration? What will you be facing? And we'll conclude with, with some final remarks, uh, which will uh, you know, also note that we will circulate this uh, presentation in a taped form uh, via email to you. And we'll add a little extra bonus, uh, one of the recent publications that, that we have done on the uh, so-called arbitral summary proceedings in English, by the way. So I think, uh, Bas, uh, just an in introduction and background, perhaps you could uh, yeah, kick off. I think that will be a good start. Thank you, Rogier, and welcome to everyone attending this uh, this webinar. Uh, as Rogier rightly noted, we have a rather diverse audience. We have people from practice, we have people from arbitral institutions and academics, and uh, we have uh, quite a couple of uh, in-house counsel. Um, that's uh, the reason why we'd like to keep it practical, as practical as possible, but of course there's always a bit of theory. Uh, as, as an academic, I think I should uh, I should also have a bit of focus on that. So, uh, Part-time academic, yeah? Part-time academic, so it's also uh, part-time theory, and uh, uh, I'm a professor for one day a week, so the other 80% of this, uh, of, of this webinar will be uh, aimed at uh, getting you an idea of how things work in practice. Um, like I said, uh, uh, Bosman Zelst, I'm a, I'm a uh, partner here at Vodorna for five days a week and on the weekends I am a, or at least that's how it's felt by some, on the weekends I practice uh, academia. Uh, I'm a professor of district resolution and arbitration at, uh, at Maastricht University. Um, uh, quite a bit of track record when it comes to uh, publications in the field of, of mostly arbitration, uh, but also more broad, uh, also uh, related to uh, ethical issues, uh, how to act as a lawyer uh, uh, more generally, as well as uh, class actions uh, and other issues of Dutch procedural law. But my focus is on arbitration and the focus of this um, of this webinar is also on arbitration or more specifically what occurs when you move a case from uh, litigation to arbitration and that could be a pending case, a, a, a case currently pending before the courts or maybe because you've agreed in a dispute resolution clause that you will uh, go to the courts uh, when a dispute arises. Um, that's something uh, that could happen as well. So you're destined for the courts, so to speak, uh, what uh, can be done uh, in, in terms of the options that arbitration uh, provides. Yeah, in terms of my background, over the past uh, 20 years or so, just about 20 years of, of arbitration practice with a bit of corporate in between, uh, I've seen quite a few of these instances where people move from litigation to arbitration. <clears throat> and we note that in the present COVID times, and we'll come to that uh, shortly, uh, that's a live topic on which we uh, publish a bit on, on LinkedIn and other fora. Uh, we got some question reactions which prompted us to do this uh, this webinar um, to explain to you how it actually works. Uh, besides my practice as, uh, as counsel, I sit as arbitrator. I'm also a member of the Dutch uh, contingent at the IC Court of Arbitration, where we sit with two Dutch people who do the checks, i.e. scrutiny of arbitral awards. 
in that capacity I also take part in various working groups on emergency arbitration to which we'll speak. I'm also quite active at the Netherlands Arbitration Institute for years uh, on end already and I've done quite a bit of research on the NIE summary arbitral proceedings, arbitral kortgeding in Dutch, uh, to which we shall also be uh, speaking. But let's, uh, let's crack on because the courts are under pressure, Bas. So yes, definitely. Just by means of a preliminary remark, we're not in the business of, of bashing the court system, rather to the contrary, uh, arbitration wouldn't function without a properly functioning court system, and that's, that goes particularly for the Netherlands in the context of uh, recognition and enforcement and setting aside procedures. So uh, once again, we're not here to uh, discourage you from going to the courts, uh, but we're here to provide you the alternatives and the options when uh, you uh, are in a court procedure or a court procedure may arise, uh, which is likely or potentially uh, stalled at some point in time. Yeah, because there's quite a few things are ongoing. Oh, yes, Do you have indeed. some bullets here? I have some bullets here. Uh, the courts are under pressure. That, that will be a euphemism, I, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. There's um, Every four years, the courts are scrutinized by a high-level committee. Uh, last time around, it was a committee presided over by Femke Halsema, so the current mayor of uh, the Council of Amsterdam or the municipality of Amsterdam, I must say. And it was found that there is underfinancing and uh, quite hefty, uh, 50 million a year or yearly, uh, uh, the courts are short on financing. Uh, um, um, and that is exacerbated by a decrease in incoming cases. If we see a number of cases the courts deal with each year, uh, uh, as to which they, of course, uh, um, get court fees paid, um, and that has been decreasing by somewhere between 50,000 to 100,000 cases each year in the last couple of years. So we're now at, I think, 1.6 million cases. And that sounds a lot, uh, but there's obviously also quite a bit of, of smaller matters uh, concerned there. So uh, whilst uh, the number of incoming cases is decreasing, um, the complexity of the cases the courts are dealing with are uh, increasing or is increasing. And that leads to increasing work pressure for, for courts, for judges, uh, and thus, I would say, to prolonged processing times. Um, and courts have, um, and that has been all over the newspapers in the Netherlands, have had challenges in their digitization efforts. Uh, the idea was to uh, basically make all procedures uh, uh, digital, so electronic, so to speak, but that uh, effort has failed, I think it's safe to say, uh, and um, the associated uh, spending uh, has, of course, uh, been on the courts uh, and weighed on the courts quite hefty. So um, that's a, that's a source of concern as well, also from the financial perspective. Uh, and lastly, an issue that we've been uh, seeing is that uh, timelines uh, are increasing, in particular when it comes to the taking of evidence, the hearing of a witness uh, or a procedure pertaining to the hearing of a witness could, uh, could last for uh, eight to ten months at this point in time which of course is not helpful if you're if you're basically inquiring what is the status uh, of your case uh, and, and you're just looking to to come to an uh, to the taking of evidence and to evidentiary research well COVID-19 has aggravated these problems uh, um, on March 15th the uh, courts announced that they would close except for urgent matters now, uh, then on April 24th, the Temporary Act of COVID-19 was introduced, was passed in, in, uh, in the Senate, uh, and, and that is applicable as of 16 March 2020 and applicable until 1 September 2020 in any case. Um, and under that law, the number of in-person hearings is, is severely limited. There's increased possibilities, I must say, for electronic hearings. Uh, but the number of hearings as such uh, is likely to be limited and that of course uh, leads to further delay uh, and backlogs, the risk of backlogs in, in, in the future. So that on the courts and the current status of the courts, but today uh, as promised by uh, Rogier and myself, we will discuss how to utilize arbitration to progress cases. Um, uh, so basically how can you help your business uh, uh, with maybe a move from litigation to arbitration. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point, uh, Bas, also for the next slide, which to which we'll turn to in a bit. But the, uh, the backlogs are, are quite substantial and it's not a negative about the courts, it's understandable. 
But for example, here in Amsterdam, where we're looking at the district court case, that is really, really urgent given the client's age and the matter at issue. Um, we, uh, we filed a statement of defense last week and the hearing date will only be scheduled. Yeah. I decided upon by the end of uh, July. So it will take about a month and a half to, uh, to get to a date uh, for the hearing that will likely take place if all goes well uh, this side of Christmas, uh, given the extreme urgency uh, at issue. So there are backlogs and apparently the assessment there was that this what we got back when we called the court about this 29 July date being a bit far out, is that there are about 400 uh, you know, bigger commercial cases you know, in a backlog situation. They have a, you know, a huge pile of cases that have been delayed and, uh, and, and caused complexity in terms of progress uh, due to COVID. But we must say also, we had a hearing yesterday in the district court in, uh, in The Hague on a, on a fairly sizable arbitration matter um, that had to go into the courts for, uh, for uh, further proceedings that the courts are making a real good effort to streamline stuff, uh, but they face a problem. And you may face a problem that you uh, that you want to get out of uh, by going into arbitration, which is the next slide. Now, uh, if, if you are considering a move like that, um, the, the open door that we tend to kick in is that you have to front load your, your thinking. Uh, that applies to all sorts of litigation and contentious scenarios. It's wise to think ahead of what will be coming. Um, why is that an open door and why is that a topic at all? Because in the uh, in the case of, of, of litigation in state courts, uh, there's only so much you can do in terms of front loading strategically because you'll be using a standard set of court rules. Whereas if you go into arbitration, which is what you might consider, you would have to think ahead about the structure of your proceedings. We'll come to that. Arbitration is a flexible process and it places a lot of responsibility on the parties and on your counsel uh, with respect to the organization of the procedure. And given that it is a flexible thing, um, there's quite a bit of uh, thinking to be done ahead. And you'll be thinking about matters from two perspectives or more if there are more parties, i.e., you know, what would my counterpart think about moving to arbitration? What does it bring or, or, or uh, lose from my own perspective? And items that you'll be considering is, for example, damages. Is either of the parties looking at damages to be accelerated? Can you afford to pay them? How are you going to, to evidence them? Is staying in business or in a joint venture a key item? Uh, is there a critical time path that you that you need to go by? Is there a specific performance scenario? Scenario? Do we need to you know, sit back, gain time or not? Um, and in particular, also, what's the perspective in terms of leverage? Is there is there a strategic advantage or disadvantage in moving your case ahead? There are lots of factors that you really need to think about carefully, and also put yourself in the position or in the shoes or the stat. Of your uh, of your counterparty to uh, to figure out what their their let's say score chart may look like uh, in order for you to have a constructive dialogue about actually moving a case from a potentially stalled uh, scenario in the state courts into something that actually moves ahead in arbitration um, and you should know that arbitrations can also get their own dynamic because as a matter of at least Dutch arbitration law, but also practice at the ICC and the NIE, the Netherlands Arbitration Institute in particular, arbitrators get, get pushed around or get incentivized financially at the ICC, otherwise at the NIE to keep uh, moving ahead, to push cases from moving forward. So you'll be confronted with, with arbitrators as opposed to judges who take a real interest in moving the case forward, which has a good uh, and potentially a not so good side. Again, something that you need to think about to uh, to resolve upon whether or not an arbitration will or will not be of assistance to you in the case that you are dealing with. Um, so front loading thinking and discussing that carefully with your with your counsel and internally with your teams is a crucial thing. Uh, and there are no goods and bads per se, but I think the trick is to uh, to 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 also think about your counterparty's perspective before you engage in the discussion. We did that on a couple of occasions. In September last year, we moved a case that got stalled in terms of taking of evidence out of the state courts into arbitration. We had one that was destined to go to binding advice, moved that into a fast track proceeding, which is the first item on the next uh, slide, expedited procedures. Uh, it requires thinking to do it successfully. And um, it's a two-way discussion. So you need to, yeah. uh, I think, approach it as a, 
as something that you do together with your counterparty because there's no way of forcing your counterparty into arbitration if there's no agreement uh, in place uh, for starters. Yes, and, and to add to that, because we, we get that question, uh, how does that work? How do uh, arbitral institutions like the ICC and the NAI uh, move a case forward or force arbitrator to move a case forward? Uh, well, it's, that's fairly simple at the ICC. There's rules that basically provide that you get caught on your fees as an arbitrator if you don't move uh, or, or don't handle the case within the given time frames, as agreed between the parties, those time frames, but still. Yeah, uh, there's not a lot of excuse there. No. So it's, it's not, well, the parties have been delaying or uh, whatever the hell. Uh, arbitrators on their own motion have to uh, take care of the time planning, in particular with respect to the time between the last procedural steps taken by the parties and the, the rendering of the actual award. Because you will know if you're an experienced litigator and an experienced, let's say, user, as it's called, of arbitration, yeah. uh, that it can take quite a bit of time between the last hearing or last written act and the actual award coming out. Now, at the ICC in particular, the mechanism is very strict on arbitrators and creates lots of, uh, let's say, interesting dynamics. If you're on the IC court, you, you get to witness that. Yeah. Uh, but it's also the case if you're an arbitrator sitting at those institutions. Definitely. Um, Definitely. So, Bas, if you look at this from the perspective of opportunities, you have yes. two main items, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, first, uh, the key potential upsides of arbitration. What uh, we see when people present on arbitration, they generally give you the upsides and the downsides of arbitration. But uh, as Uwe rightly uh, said, it's, 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 it's a dynamic issue. Uh, it's really, uh, it's, it's about perspectives and viewpoints or parameters. It, and it's not about uh, right or wrong, uh, a flexible arbitration for instance, in terms of the taking of evidence, um, both also nationally and internationally. Um, you may be interested in, in cross-examination in a case. Well, that's something that's not on offer at the Dutch courts, but it is obviously in, in the international arbitration context. Uh, the same goes for language. Uh, uh, English language proceedings are on offer at uh, the, the Netherlands Commercial Court here in Amsterdam, but otherwise uh, not at the Dutch courts. Uh, um, I might even share a, an article that uh, our, our associate Judith uh, van der Linde and myself wrote on the NCC and how to, to use the NCC in arbitral proceedings, uh, uh, but that's for a later time. Uh, more generally, the point is here that there's flexibility in agreeing on procedural arrangements, uh, uh, and that, that is of course not unlimited, um, but the flexibility exists and now the question is, whether that is an upside for you as a party in an arbitration, does that suit your interest or does it not? Would you rather have a court apply those rather strict uh, uh, court rules that are standard in Dutch uh, uh, court proceedings? So, so, so that's, that's the question mark. Basically, each of these points should end with a question mark in that respect. Uh, same with neutrality. Uh, that I think particularly applies to cases that are still to be brought to a court and not, not necessarily pending cases, but um, uh, it might arise in pending cases as well. The upside of course, is that you as a Dutch party in a dispute with an English party may have a French seated arbitrator uh, rule on your, uh, on your case. Uh, and that of course promotes the idea of neutrality. There's no arbitrators involved from the jurisdictions of the parties and that might help uh, uh, to resolve the dispute efficiently and might even also help to, uh, to come to a settlement at an earlier stage, uh, which of course is uh, something to be preferred. Uh, the expertise, I think that's, uh, uh, that's, that's less of a question mark. Uh, one of the options that arbitration provides is that you could, uh, can, or can, I must say, you can uh, nominate arbitrators that have specific expertise in the field that your dispute has arisen in. Uh, one could think of IT contracting, that's a rather specific exercise uh, um, and it would be useful for an arbitrator to have that expertise that the courts or judges, individual judges in the courts do not have. They're, they're more generalists, it's being said. Lastly, uh, enforceability. We had a discussion on whether that should be a question mark or not, because indeed there's obviously quite a bit of discussion on the enforceability of arbitral uh, uh, awards. But I think the point is that parties that litigate arbitrate in good faith would in the end uh, uh, agree that the result must be enforceable and enforced uh, uh, even if you are on the losing side of the of the arbitration because that's what good faith uh, or parties arbitrating or litigating in good faith do they accept the outcome 
uh, if all procedural arrangements are have been uh, have been complied with. Yeah, I think the point is also that if you if you go into arbitration and an award comes out, that is in principle an, an enforceable title. There's no appeal, and the award can be enforced in the Netherlands, but also outside the Netherlands under the New York Convention in particular, in 160 plus countries. Mm -hmm. So you are in trouble if you are at the receiving end of an award that you don't like. So yeah. if you are a good faith litigator or litigation party and you want to go into that process, you think, you know, whatever the outcome may be, I will, I will comply, then all is well. But if you are in a position and, and, or your counterpart is in a position that they, uh, they are not so sure whether they're going to, going to comply mm -hmm. with an arbitration award, if it comes out, then that may be a potential downside. Anyways, it's a good thing to think about. Uh, what it will mean because uh, it, so it turns out that there are parties around to engage in let's say litigation processes and may have a lot of uh, you know cards hidden or scenarios in mind for what will happen if they inadvertently lose the case which is fine uh, but it's something to take into account no definitely and, and i'm not saying that opposing enforce and enforcement of an arbitral award is is as such an act of, of bad faith not at all, not at all. No. Uh, uh, but obviously the idea of an arbitration as court proceedings uh, is that you come to a solution and that at some point uh, the discussion must end and um, uh, that's why we see that arbitral awards uh, it follows from research that arbitral awards are complied with voluntarily Quite regularly, and I think the the uh, there, there's there are surveys that say, that say that the, this is the case in about 80% of the cases. So that I think is 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 definitely a, a positive. Um, and lastly, that's not on the slides. Um, the What's issue, that? It's <laughs> <laughs> what's not on the slides. It's a big secret. It's it's centrality, uh, uh, and I know that doesn't say uh, much as such. But uh, uh, in addition to the cases that uh, Wilhir just mentioned. Uh, we have experience with uh, bringing five pending court cases into one arbitration, so into one central venue where the dispute is is resolved. And uh, that, I would say, is also quite obviously an advantage, having associated or related disputes be uh, resolved by one and the same um, adjudicator, in this case, uh, a sole arbitrator. Uh, um, of course, that brings some interesting question with with respect to how to consolidate these these proceedings. But it is an option uh, that uh, that arbitration provides. For. So that, in terms of the once again potential upsides of arbitration, and against that background, we're going to present to you in in, in the next uh, 20 25 minutes three three building blocks of how to organize your arbitral proceedings that may be. Of, uh, of assistance in considering whether you would like to move to arbitration either from a pending case or uh, for future cases. Um, and I think Ogier will uh, guide us through uh, the possibility of expedited or fast track arbitration proceedings. Uh, he's also working on that at the NAI uh, to introduce that uh, in the NAI rules. So, okay. Sure, yeah. So it's gonna be three topics, expedited arbitration, arbitral summary proceedings and electronic hearings. <clears throat> Uh, you'll do the last one definitely and i'm going to start with the first one uh in a short while uh because this is really uh you know what you what you will get into so if you move from litigation to arbitration there are not a lot of parties that ultimately will say you know we'll take it easy take some years we've agreed it's going to take years typically you will get into a setting where parties are highly motivated or council are uh, you know pressed to be motivated to keep things going to get it moving uh, and they'll be referring to, or let's say, have in their minds, the notion of so-called expedited or fast-track arbitral proceedings, uh, spoed bodem procedures, as they're called in the Netherlands. Over Dutch. Uh, and they're hip and happening in arbitration uh, settings, so it's a good uh, thing to be aware of that. Uh, and I'm also noting it uh, by reference to two topics that we discussed earlier, front-loading. Yeah. This is really where you have to know what you're going to get into and what your sort of scorecard is, what are you looking for, what are you looking out for. Um, and you have to be aware of the um, uh, the notion that uh, that there are the goods and the bad sides. So now, if you are going into arbitration, you may be confronted with the expedited or fast track proceedings as a notion. Now, what's that all about? Um, it exists at various institutions at the ICC. Um, as Bas was saying, the idea is to introduce it at the Netherlands Arbitration Institute in, in the nearest uh, time. Uh, and various other institutions in, in London, the LCIA, the 
uh, SEC in Stockholm, in Hong Kong, have, have introduced this over the years. And the idea is basically, it's an open door again, how do you get the actual case or proceedings on the merits, ten gronde, done as fast as you possibly can. And that has to be done. So um, now that is quite a thing because it, uh, it, is, it sounds really obvious, but in practice it's quite difficult to do that successfully because you need to know, as I just noted, and earlier as well, you need to know what you're getting into because the procedure will be simplified. It will be a slimmed down, trimmed down procedure with, with less opportunity to, uh, to, to get into sideways. Uh, most people thinking about it in the abstract are quite positive about that. That's a good plan. Let's let's keep it simple and let's get it get it done in an efficient way. Not a lot of people, certainly not clients, will will say that's a bad plan. Uh, I'm also of the school that it is generally a good idea. However, um, one of the key drawbacks potentially is that if if you if you are in the simplification exercise and you simplify too much, you still end up with a final arbitral award. That you can't do anything about anymore. So it's your one shot at having a decent procedure uh, conducted for you. And if it's too simple for the case at hand, that may in and by itself create an issue because the award that you'll get will be the final outcome. So you can't oversimplify. Um, and that's that's a that's a cru crucial point there. So let's not be too enthusiastic and think very careful about what you're going to do, because you're also going to be looking at uh, uh, the fourth bullet now. You're going to be looking at slimmed down or limited possibilities for taking of evidence. The general idea is to limit the number of witnesses. You'll be able to hear witnesses generally. Uh, you'll be able to have some document discovery. And that all sounds, again, pretty fine. That's a good plan. Let's not have too much of that. But if you're in a position on the basis of your front load thinking and your, your score chart that you're going to need uh, evidence by witnesses, or evidence that you haven't gotten hold of yet, that's in the possession of your counterparty, bus, for example, mm -hmm. you need a provision to actually get your hands on that. And that generally takes time. And if you've not provided for that, uh, the whole system may actually collapse because that's the next bullet. If you agree to very, very strict deadlines, those deadlines and that scenario that you have together agreed upon to move from litigation to arbitration becomes the framework on which you have agreed. Uh, and it requires your counterparty's consent, in principle, to move around those deadlines, because that's the basis on which BOSS, my counterparty, has agreed to move from litigation to arbitration, the strict timelines and the limited possibilities. And then there will be sort of, you know, more constraints for me to argue, listen, BOSS, that's all very well, but due process requires that we have more time, right? BOSS will say, no, that's not, that's not my agreement with you to move from litigation to arbitration. So again, strict timelines are the bottom line, are the starting point, but may come down to haunt you if you are too enthusiastic about that. It also applies to setting a strict timeline for awards. Tribunals will tend to be a bit skeptical. They want to move along. They understand what they're getting into. They know that it, that is what the parties want, but they will also be anticipating scenarios in which due process or complications will cause them to need more time uh, or they We'll have to think about uh, uh, matters more carefully or run into issues that are in particular in these fast track proceedings underdeveloped haven't been properly pleaded yet should actually be pleaded also because there's no chance for an appeal so if you as an arbitrator or tribunal with multiple arbitrators sit and, and evaluate the case after the last oral argument in your super fast track proceedings and you run into an issue that's not properly developed and in which you would actually have to decide for lack of argument, left or right, that's a bit of a dilemma because it's over and done. It's an enforceable award that you're going to render. Uh, so it is a bit difficult to, to give a hard timeline. It sounds very, very appealing at the outset. It's also likely the client's instruction to do it. But again, that's a couple of slides struck uh, uh, back. <laughs> Front-loading thinking, having thought about that very carefully in advance, is what you actually need to do. Uh, also, to uh, to have a good view on costs, because cost projection for clients is obviously key. Uh, certainly in these times, which are economically challenging, um, you need to limit them. You need to be careful about it also to be able to get them fully reimbursed. If you are on the prevailing side, the winning side in the arbitration, you can't just blow costs. 
uh, needs to be carefully done and budgeted. Uh, and again, that, that requires careful, careful thinking. So uh, moving from litigation to arbitration and, and, and being happy and enthusiastic about now finally fast tracking and, uh, and getting it over and done with is all perfectly fine, but it does require careful uh, thinking uh, uh, at the outset. Um, and, and, and I should also note that uh, the notion of these standard expedited and fast track proceedings is all very well, presupposes that a dispute hasn't already been you know, litigated on in parts, hasn't been subject of some litigation already. But if that's the case, if there's a legacy of submissions and perhaps also or argument, a legacy litigation that you're moving into an arbitration, that needs to be properly synchronized. But we'll come to that under the heading of, of technicalities. Definitely. Yeah. Anything that you wanted to add about? Oh, just, just one key issue. A due process is, of course, the yardstick uh, uh, when it comes to setting aside procedures or recognition and enforcement proceedings. Uh, but it's generally also the stick you try and use uh, is to get your arbitrators moving in terms of the procedure when the procedure is not uh, yeah. uh, is it, it, not conducted as you, as you would like to. Maybe even in accordance with what you agree to in the context of the expedited or fast track arbitration proceedings. <clears throat> but in, if you've agreed to fast track arbitration proceedings, uh, this due process as a stick to get your arbitrator moving is also likely to be much less effective because the arbitrators will find, look, you've agreed on fast track proceedings. You've basically commissioned us to do this, to do, to do this short and snappy. So we're going to do that, even though uh, uh, um, you may have all sorts of concerns, sort of concerns with respect to due process. You could have brought that, that up much earlier. You should have, as we here rightly said, front loaded your thinking. Now you've not, that is your problem. Yeah. Uh, so you would want to avoid that uh, on any and all occasions. Yeah, I should have touched upon, I think, the second bullet if you look at the screen, which basically says normally reserved for claims of limited financial value. Uh, something I didn't you know, spend time on with you. Um, is these fast track proceedings obviously is a balance between speed and substance to some extent. The general thinking is that it is acceptable if the claim is not too big, because you want to have some proportionality between time and cost expenditure and the value at stake. And that's why most institutions say, okay, you're going to get these proceedings typically automatically if the value of the claims, leaving aside how you calculate that for now, but if the value of the claims at stake is below a certain threshold. At the ICC, the threshold currently is 2 million US dollars. It's likely to be raised this summer because the rules are under revision to move to 4 million US dollars. That is a limited financial interest. Obviously, that depends upon the size of your company and the various issues at stake, whether or not it's true or fair to say that that is a limited value because it's still a lot of money to a lot of people and a lot of companies in a lot of circumstances. But generally, that is thought of internationally, two to four or five million as a claim of limited value. And we've done some research uh, into the, uh, let's say the views in the Dutch market as well. Uh, empirical research uh, last year on which we published at the Dutch Arbitration uh, Association's day in October. Happy to share if you're interested. But also the thinking in the Netherlands is that a claim of roughly about 2 million is fine for fast track proceedings anyhow. Uh, but again, this is a balancing act. So you should know that this is in the background of uh, the thinking of whether or not it is acceptable to to uh, to that speed and cost reduction prevail over uh, perhaps more time required to deal with a certain dispute of a certain value. Yeah, and of course the complexity of the case is also a very important factor. Yeah, uh, uh, parties might be looking for a, 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 an answer by an by a legal expert in a fairly uh, simple case. That, yeah. that pertains to a fairly simple legal question or, or a fairly legal question, I should maybe say. And then fast track proceedings may be uh, helpful even where the dispute in, uh, or the value dispute is much higher than, than two or five uh, yeah. million. That's right. Now let's move over to the next one. Uh, that is what's called a arbitral summary proceedings. The Dutch term is arbitral kort geding. Uh, we know that we have mostly Dutch speakers here but some English speakers. So um, I should note very carefully that it's important that, that, you, that you're aware of the notion of kortgeding, which is a fast track summary proceedings as we call them at the Dutch state courts, also exists in arbitration. Yeah. And the tricky thing is that from a Dutch perspective, the practice at the state courts has 
let's say, been transposed at the end of the 90s, when this was introduced at the Netherlands Arbitration Institute in particular, into arbitration proceedings. So in arbitration, the same sort of mechanism is applied as one would typically see in the state courts. Uh, but to translate that as arbitral summary proceedings is quite a difficult thing for most annual American lawyers because they don't associate summary proceedings with arbitral or court geding proceedings as we know them. Summary is a far less intrusive, far more provisional kind of thing than the court geding in the, in the Dutch state courts and also in arbitration has proved to be or has developed to be. So in the, in the state courts we have seen the court geding summary proceedings develop since the early uh, 20th century in Amsterdam it started off and developed into something that is a lot more far-reaching than let's say the provisional technical interim relief can be quite uh, far-reaching I'll come to what that may be uh, and it turns out uh, that the same has occurred or has transposed into arbitration practice uh, over the last couple of years, I have done uh, on, on a couple of occasions research with uh, Martje de Vries Lens uh, Hoeven, a former colleague at, uh, at De Brouw, another law firm here in Amsterdam. Um, and we have studied all the arbitral awards rendered at the Netherlands Arbitration Institute and have published on that. Uh, and the publication is on the website of the Netherlands Arbitration Institute. I'll, I'll give you a link. Uh, on the next slide in a, in a bit as well, so don't worry if you uh, if you can't find it. But the bottom line really is that that we are looking at a very Dutch uh, type of proceedings, and they're available both prior to proceedings on the marriage, so before you actually have an arbitration on the actual case, the main case, and also pending these proceedings. So you can do arbitral summary proceedings pending in the midst of an ongoing arbitration if you run into something that is urgent and the standard of urgency as the as lawyers on the on the webinar will know can be a pretty low standard certainly if you compare it to the international uh, views on whether or not this sort of thing should be available the international term that is typically used for these proceedings is, is called emergency arbitration that's the term at the icc i was on the task force with some other dutch people that studied the various practices in various countries and the experiences that have been gained over the last couple of years uh, at, the, um, at the ICC with these emergency proceedings, it turns out that the spectrum is very wide between what you can and cannot get. And the Dutch practice is extremely liberal in terms of the sort of relief that you can get and the very low standards of urgency. So if you move into a Dutch setting from litigation to arbitration and you so happen to choose in particular for the arbitration under the Netherlands Arbitration Institute's rules and IE rules, uh, and you have a place of arbitration, crucial factor, in the Netherlands, this option of summary proceedings is also life. And it can be quite a thing uh, in terms of, of scenario planning that you have to take account of. Because you can start these proceedings uh, at 24 hour notice by getting an arbitrator appointed. That's basically the timeline that the NIE is very careful in delivering upon, and they do. And within 24 hours, you thus will have a specific arbitrator dealing with this specific uh, set of proceedings. And the thinking is to have a hearing within two weeks. You can battle that being an electronic hearing nowadays yeah. in the present times. That can also apply to your parties who might sit on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean or have to fly over the North Pole to get here. They will be called into these uh, hearings within very short notice or at very short notice. And it will lead to an award typically in the two to three month time frame. And that award is actually enforceable. So this is this is quite a thing. Now, what do you what do you get in these proceedings? What happens uh, in again in this in this Dutch setting, which is transposed in, into an international arena, if you go for NIE arbitration or the place of arbitration in the Netherlands, what do you get? You may get specific performance as relief and now the second and the second bullet and the sub bullet so specific performance in in dutch and it should have been spelled with an n of course the term would be nakoming uh, specific performance is a very it's not let's say it's not the first point of call in terms of remedies for anglo-saxon uh, practitioners and parties they will be thinking about damages as a remedy if there's a breach of contract or non-performance whereas in continental europe in particular also countries like the netherlands our standard remedy is if you, if you fail to perform the contract, you may be confronted with a, with a claim and may be granted 
for specific performance, nakomi, either or not on pain of a penal sum, dwangstom, in summary proceedings, also internationally. And that is quite a thing to be aware of. And if you read the research paper on the NIE website, you'll see that this actually happens with very high or very substantial penal sums attached to it. So it's not, it's not a, um, let's say, illusion or um, a pie in the sky kind of remedy. It's, an, it's a real option with real consequences. Uh, and again, if you're not uh, prepared for that in terms of your front loading ahead of going into this arena, you haven't thought about it, you may come in for a surprise or you may actually surprise someone else, depending upon the perspective that you have. Yeah, for the Dutch lawyers in, in the webinar, uh, our impression would be that uh, uh, payment of monetary sums and specific performance are awarded more easily in arbitral summary proceedings than in normal interim relief proceedings at the at the courts. So in, 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 in the yeah. uh, uh, court at the courts. So that's something to be uh, to to be very much uh, acutely aware of. Yeah, I think the reason being that that a hearing in these proceedings will typically be granted substantial time. You'll get about an hour an hour and a half at the regular state courts, you might get a day uh, in summary arbitral proceedings, a day for the entire oral argument. That is extremely long by comparison to, uh, to state court proceedings. So there's enough time to actually look at the issue uh, and the arbitrator gets paid to do it. So they tend to actually take a look uh, and resolve upon it if they can. So standards of urgency, complexity, and whether or not specific performance can be granted uh, are, are impacted by this, by this practice of, of allotting substantial time to disputes that require the time to, to resolve. Definitely. And for, for, for the yeah. Dutch uh, listeners uh, and lookers, <laughs> uh, viewers, um, uh, the Dutch would say when there's the potential of injustice, there is urgency. So uh, uh, that I think uh, uh, tells the story quite effectively. Yeah, that's how it can play out. Yeah. Now on payment or play out, uh, payment of monetary sums perfectly possible in these proceedings. A lifting of attachments can be done. Actually, granting attachments beslagen cannot be done because that's not arbitrable. Uh, enforcement of obligations to enter into agreements. They, you should think about in, in proper Dutch the precontractuele goede trouw, i.e., getting someone to conclude a final agreement if there is already an agreement on essentials in place. Very Dutch kind of thing. But you'll be aware of the fact that quite a few people and parties have been trying to move out of agreements that had been all but finally signed and sealed and delivered, given the COVID situations. You can bring actions to hold infringements, i.e. non-performance non, non of contracts, competition clauses, IP rights, etc., etc., etc. I already mentioned that, that tribunals get to be appointed within a day. Strict deadlines apply, i.e. You know, they actually set the hearing date. There will not be a round of asking for dates of availability. There will basically be a firm uh, dates that straight away by the arbitrator, that is what he or she, or if you female arbitrators are expected to do. You get your award in four to six weeks. I think it generally is a little bit longer, but it may be faster if so required indeed. The award is enforceable, certainly in the Netherlands, because the award is equated or put on the same footing by operation of the Dutch Arbitration Act, um, as all the other arbitral awards would be. So it counts as a proper award by operation of law. Internationally, it's more complex if you're really interested in, in whether or not you could enforce arbitral summary proceeding awards outside the Netherlands. I'm happy to share a publication on that topic that we put into the Dutch Journal on Arbitration a couple of years ago. That's a bit of a nuanced issue, but there's quite a bit to be said. And the costs are limited. Uh, it's not too expensive. It's fast-tracked and the losing party gets to pay, ultimately. Now, if you are in, uh, in, in need to get some more information on this topic, contact me or pass but you can also look at a publication that we have uh, put into the Dutch Journal of Arbitration last year, being uh, Marche de Proeve de Vries Lens, and myself uh, in English. It's called Arbitral Emergency Proceedings because I already mentioned that this is the international term, and the edition à la Hollandaise is there because it's a particularly Dutch way of doing it. And if you don't have the recipe of Hollandaise sauce uh, at hand, that's also in a footnote. So. Uh, various reasons to read the article uh, if you want to, but it gives you a nice in, in impression of these proceedings and how they actually work out. I'm happy to share it if you don't have access to the uh, to this publication. Now, Bas, I think uh, we don't have the opportunity to move on to electronic hearings, right? I think so. 
uh, yes, electronic hearings is something that we see the courts get more and more acquainted with at the moment. And that, of course, makes sense in view of the uh, of the legislation I, I discussed at the introduction. Um, uh, but so of course they're getting acquainted. But in arbitration, electronic hearing electronic hearings have been more common uh, historically, uh, um, not just for uh, uh, procedural hearings, but also on the merits. Uh, uh, arbitration hearings are uh, or electronic hearings in arbitration are are a more common thing to do, and that makes sense obviously in in, in the international context with people from all over the world involved potentially in an arbitration. Well. Um, the Dutch legislator uh, wanted to promote the Dutch Arbitration Act or promote the Netherlands as a venue for arbitration when it introduced uh, the new Arbitration Act, the DAA, Dutch Arbitration Act, in uh, 2015. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the uh, selling points was the uh, specific rules with respect to electronic uh, arbitral proceedings. Uh, and there's this Article 1072B of the Dutch Code of Civil Procedure or Dutch Arbitration Act which provides for that, and that contains various elements. So electronic communications, electronic filings, electronic hearings, and electronic awards even. Um, my focus for now will be on the electronic hearings, and also in view of time, I'll, I'll try and be uh, uh, short, but uh, uh, there is a lot to be said uh, about this. We're working on a publication um, that uh, discusses this. Uh, the key point is that Article 1072B of the Dutch Code of Civil Procedure basically uh, provides that arbitrators have the discretionary power to order um, a hearing to be conducted electronically. Uh, now, that being said, well, that seems like a, a simple, hard and fast rule, uh, and I think that it was meant that way, uh, uh, but the parties uh, cannot deviate from that rule, uh, and that's where the issue comes in, because uh, underlying uh, any arbitration proceeding and any procedural ar arrangement in arbitration in the Netherlands uh, are the basic rules or the key principles of Article 1036 of the Dutch Arbitration Act. Uh, and uh, one of them, and maybe the most important of them, is equality. So basically, the choice to have an, an, a hearing conducted electronically might negatively affect the uh, position of one of the parties. Uh, I, I gave the uh, concept of uh, for example, of cross-examination uh, in terms of the taking of evidence in an international context that might be an issue. And one might say, what is the problem? Because both parties have the problem with the proper uh, cross-examination not being possible, because you would say a, a proper cross-examination requires people to be in the same room. Now, what if everyone has that problem? But uh, uh, that, I think, is a bit too simplistic of you. Uh, just to, to give you an example, if you are a buyer in an M&A transaction, you have a dis you're having a discussion on the quality of the disclosures, you would really want to have a proper cross-examination or a proper, um, as an alternative, uh, a proper document disclosure discussion. And if you're not having that, you're not likely to be able to substantiate your case. So in that case, not having the cross-examination in the proper way might affect you uh, more than it does uh, the seller in that transaction. That's just sitting back and, and saying, well, uh, uh, you're, you're arguing that this, this uh, contract was concluded in error, uh, bring it on. I'm safe and sound here behind my, uh, behind my laptop screen. So equality is, is a key principle in considering, uh, I argue, uh, uh, or in the consideration by the arbitrators, I argue, uh, in uh, whether or not to order an electronic hearing in arbitration. The same goes with the, with the principle of effectivity. Um, we've seen that in the uh, Dutch context, in the, in, in the criminal law proceedings, where the DA was allowed to be in the room with the judge, whereas uh, uh, the defendant and its counsel were not. And there, uh, one could argue, yeah, it's it's more difficult to effectively present your case if you're not in the room with the with the judge or the arbitrator, whereas the other party is. So that, of course, is also a, a, a key issue. Um, conversely, there's the issue or the, uh, the rule in the Dutch Arbitration Act that provides that arbitrators are to protect the parties and the parties are to protect each other against unreasonable, unreasonable delay of the arbitral proceedings. Then one could obviously see that if there's no uh, hearing in an arbitration uh, and the arbitration gets stalled and it needs to be rescheduled, that will likely take 
a lot of time. Now, is that delay unreasonable? If it is, then uh, uh, the Dutch Arbitration Act doesn't dictate, but it does give the uh, arbitrators the power to uh, take any action against a, such an unreasonable delay. So uh, uh, one of those actions could be ordering an electronic hearing as to which arbitrators have the uh, discretionary power in any case. Now, uh, how does that relate, uh, I would argue, to the principle of party autonomy? What if the parties both agree that there should be no electronic hearing, but that hearings should be uh, uh, done in person? Would the arbitral tribunal then still have the discretionary power of, uh, of, of ordering an electronic hearing? If you read the law very strictly, that would seem to be the case. However, uh, if you read uh, Article 103.6 uh, and more, uh, the, consider the, the, the uh, principle of party autonomy in, in arbitration, the whole reason why you are in arbitration is because you've made use uh, of the autonomous right to uh, not be in the state courts but be in arbitration. Why would arbitrators then have the right to uh, order you to be in an electronic hearing where you agree with your counterparty that you do not do not want to. That, of course, is a, is a rather fundamental question um, uh, and to which I do not have the answer, uh, I must say, uh, because uh, there's that's no... Helpful. That's helpful. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> there's limited guidance. It's yet to be tested in courts. However, I think it's safe to say if you agree uh, to a certain procedural arrangement, in particular, if you are moving your case from litigation to arbitration, uh, then those procedural arrangement, arrangements should be uh, considered by the arbitrators and should be taken very seriously. Uh, that has the upside, I think, here of, of the electronic hair. Hearing is not being or not likely being forced upon you. Uh, but again, there's, this is not a hard and fast rule, uh, again, I must say. Um, um, but um, this is something to very seriously consider when you are moving your case from litigation to arbitration. And I think that gives us another five minutes to discuss the technicalities. Yeah, we kept that for, for the last part because it's not the most interesting part, we must admit. Well, I think you've done the thinking, Bas, on, on moving uh, to these cases and also electronic hearings because it, yeah. it turns out that the, the arrangement in the Dutch Arbitration Act is all very well, but hasn't been sort of tried and tested on the road. No. COVID has pushed it on the road. It makes it quite, quite uh, remarkable to see what sort of fundamental points uh, mm -hmm. show up. And that's, I think you're right about benchmarking them against key principles. Uh, also saying you've done, you've done a good bit of, good bit of research uh, on this particular topic. And we have quite a lot of experience on this already prior to COVID and still today. So this is not, this is, this all sounds pretty damn easy, but again, you know, if, if you organize it properly, uh, we'll get a long way, but uh, now it, it sounds like something that should have been resolved years ago, but uh, so it turns out to be, uh, uh, leading to quite a few open questions, uh, which can be resolved, of course. Now, then moving swiftly ahead to uh, to the next line. Um, let, let's try to do that. Yeah. We're actually trying to look at a question someone proposed. But here we are. Uh, litigation, arbitration, technicalities, what are you looking at? Uh, the, the key point is that you need a so-called submission agreement. You have to agree in a separate agreement to move your case from litigation, or if it's not yet a litigation, but destined to go to litigation due to a form selection clause or just by operation of law, to arbitration. That requires an agreement and that agreement is all fine. Let's refer to that as a submission agreement for now. The key is there, uh, the key is to be acutely aware of what you're actually going to move out of the default competence of the state courts into arbitration because you're doing a so-called step out, you're, you're stepping away from your general rights by operation of the Dutch constitution in the Netherlands, but also by operation of the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 6, you're stepping out of your competent state courts to which you have a right of access, you're giving that up and you're moving into arbitration. So if you want to do that, that's fine. That needs to be clear and unequivocal. That's basically the rule as a matter of, uh, of jurisprudence, clear and unequivocal, but you also need to be damn clear about what you're actually going to move. So if you're only moving the contract dispute and re only referring to the contractual dispute per se, for example, you may or you may not, likely not, have also included the non-contractual items. So the description of the dispute of the matters that you're moving from a litigation or a default litigation context into arbitration is crucial because arbitrators can't step beyond the mandate that one gives them. 
that would be a breach of mandate. Uh, there will not be an arbitration agreement, so a party like us could say, that's all very well, it's nice to be in arbitration today, thank you for the agreement, but we have not agreed to do the non-contractual claims. I'm here for a contract claim under a contract that's called A and not contract B. And then your argument will be, that's not very nice, boss. Um, we intended everything and your answer will then be, if it so turns out to be in your client's interest, potentially, yeah, you being a nice guy, sorry, that's not going to happen. Now, you don't want that, so you need to think about what you're actually going to do. Hence, the third sub-bullet, if you want to move over and you're both inclined to do that, you want to be sufficiently broad, a wide net. That's also the bottom line of the decided cases, for example, by the, the Court of Appeal in The Hague. Don't be too restrictive and generally the standards of describing the, the actual dispute at hand are not too stringent. I mean, it's not a very, that's a technical approach, as long as you're broad and, and clear, it works. Now, what do you need to look out for? What is, what is key, particular issues? You have this transition arrangement that is crucial. If you're already in litigation, you need to think about how you're actually going to move, what needs to be done in terms of time, cost, court actions, how do you stop them? How do you appoint arbitrators? Because that can take a lot of time to actually get the people into place. Now, these sort of transition arrangements are, in my experience, Typically issues that you would discuss with an arbitration institute if you involve an arbitration institute for the administration of your case. We know that, for example, the Netherlands Arbitration Institute is a very cooperative and helpful institution. They pick up the phone and they are willing to engage with you in a conversation about the sort of thing that you need to think about. They have the limits, of course, because they have to be impartial and not do stuff that that's going to uh, come back to haunt them, but they are very practical and certainly people to be contacted, the same applies to most other institutions. If you do not have specialized counsel, you want to think about it. Now, counterclaims are, are, if you look at it in terms of empirical data, quite often left out of the picture uh, because no one has disclosed a counterclaim yet, for example, uh, and then it may be left out of the dispute that you are moving from litigation to arbitration and what you generally don't want to happen if you are the counterclaimant is that your counterclaim is left in the state courts and the rest moves over to arbitration. That's generally not uh, what you have been planning for. Fast track proceedings we discussed today is a very important thing, uh, thing to, to, to arrange for. Also perhaps to exclude the so-called arbitral summary proceedings if you don't want that. Yeah. Evidentiary matters, of course, key. How are we going to do, deal with witnesses and when? How is it going to be provided for? Language is a key point if you are minded to appoint English-speaking arbitrators, it's unhelpful to confront them with a, with a procedural file from the litigation stage that is in Dutch and vice versa. There tends to be less of an issue, of course, vice versa, but it's not helpful to get an English arbitrator to be confronted with a Dutch language uh, litigation file. Sure. But those are the sort of things that you need to think about. And that brings us to the top of the hour where we have uh, actually uh, committed to, uh, to stop. So in terms of concluding remarks, um, we have, uh, I think, provided you with, with options to consider whether or not it's viable to move your case out, your stalled court cases. Uh, we've said that it is also available in cases that have not yet commenced so, commenced, so you can do it if your case is still not started. Obvious point, but it can be done. It's manageable, limited formalities, lots of procedural arrangements available to make it happen, but do be aware of your own key interests, of course, that's the key perspective. Uh, and be mindful of your counterparty's interests because you need cooperation to do it. After this uh, session, we'll circulate the slides. Yes. We'll circulate the uh, the recording of this this webinar, and you get the uh, article that we have put on. I think slide number seven or eight uh, on the Hollandaise sauce for your next asparagus season or whatever you want to to do with it. Anything else, Bas? I don't think so. I think no? uh, I think there's one more slide, and I think that provides. Oh, yeah, slide. That's you. And you have our pictures. I'm not sure that's what you were looking for when you. Uh, that's for the darts. That's for the darts indeed. Subscribe to this uh, this webinar. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd like to just conclude by saying. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.